Sister Ruthie used to sing that. And I'd tell everybody, make sure y'all are eating your vitamins and getting in your, your minerals and, and uh, your Wheaties. <laughs> and uh, I know it's a little, may feel like you don't have enough in your hands. Anybody got hands this morning? You got hands this morning? This song says, I can feel him in my hands. You ever, you ever felt him in your hands before? Does you know what that, that means to feel him in your hands? You could be in a position to where you don't have any feelings in your hand at all. You ever been in a position, to, you ever slept on your arm wrong and you woke up and it didn't have any feeling in it? Well, I can feel the Lord in my hands. I, that's Brother Larry Johnson's statement, ain't it? I feel God. <laughs> I can feel him in my hands. Sleep that, that up, Sister Jenny. I can, I can feel him in my hands. I can feel him in my feet. You ever felt him in your feet before? We call it dancing around here. That you can, sometimes your feet move and you're not thinking about um, uh, a song from uh, The Temptations. And I didn't, nobody didn't follow me on that one. You're not thinking about a song from Elvis. Does that help anybody? Or, uh, did you not feel in a song from the Beatles or Michael Jackson or uh, Tina Turner? Y'all was like, how did Brother Brittley know all these people? I, I wasn't always saved. But what about the Lord? Can you feel the Lord in your feet? You've been in a club environment where you felt like you, or a song on the radio, you felt that beat in your feet. You know, Who, where's the, our new drummer? What's your name, brother? What's his name? What's your name? What is it? Say, Solomon. Solomon? Samuel. No, I got my French speaking. Help me, I want to get it right. Samuel? All right. Did y'all appreciate Samuel playing the drums? Y'all know, I mean, I didn't. Some, I, I, I know something about them things. But Samuel over there playing them, I felt the Lord in my feet. Yes. Felt the Lord in my hand. Yes. See, you, can, you, gotta see, you gotta feel God. Sound like Brother Larry don't. <laughs> you gotta feel God. You know God's right here in this room. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. Say that to the person beside you. Say, I'm glad you're here. Hello. Say that to the person. I'm glad, Brother Luigi, I'm glad Brother Luigi's here. I'm glad you're here. When you're not here, you're missed. I miss you when you're not here. If you're in New York, I miss you. I miss you when you're not here. Guess where God is? Look at this course. He's not dead, he's alive. As easy as you were next to you, as easy as you spoke to the person beside you and said you're glad that they're here, say that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm glad you're here. The Lord's right here. The Lord has filled his holy temple. The Lord has filled his holy temple. Isaiah chapter 6 says, Isaiah saw the train. He said, the Lord has filled his holy temple. He said, I felt his train come by. A train like a woman, and when she's in a, in a wedding, and the woman has a long dress, that's the train. And usually they have bridesmaids that make sure that that train is, is right. And the flower girls putting out the flowers, and they, sometimes they work on that. Here it says, in the year... That Uzziah died. God didn't die, but Uzziah died. He said, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled his temple. I believe his train's filling this temple right here. It's always here. The presence of the Lord is here. I can feel him. I can feel the presence of the Lord. You know, sometimes we get in a position where we can't feel God. Can't sense him. You got to... Find a scripture for him in the book of Hebrews that said we, we go into the throne room boldly. Sometimes you got to press your way into feeling the Lord. 
Sometimes you got to put yourself to the side and say, I want to feel you, Lord. I, I want to feel the Lord. Psalms 100 says, enter his gates. Psalms 100, is it verse 1? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Make a joyful noise. I don't, can't sing like Paul and, and, and uh, Sister Christina. I can't sing like them, but I can make a joyful noise. Psalms 100, verse 1, make a joyful noise. Look to your neighbor and say, can you at least make a noise? Can you? Can it, can it be joyful? Can it be a joy? Put a smile. You ever answer the phone? And sometimes, I've done this with Brother Larry Hedgepath, I could tell he was smiling on the other end of the phone. You ever sense that with anybody? You can, you can hear in their voice a smile. Here in Psalms 100, verse 1, it says, make a joyful noise. Don't just make a noise, but make a joyful noise. Put a smile behind it. The scripture says that, or is it not a scripture, is it? It says, uh, what is this old saying? I think it is. It says, uh, if you won't know, it says partly a scripture. It says, if you want to have a friend, you must show yourself friendly. The world tur turned it into, if you, if you want a smile, then you got to give a smile. Make a joyful noise. Then, uh, then the next verse says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. We got anything we can be thankful for today? I'm thankful I got a house. That I can invite you to my house and you can have a hot dog. That's a, everybody can come to my house today and have a hot dog. That's one thing I'm thankful for. I'm thankful more for you that you can come to my house than I am for my house. Isn't that the next verse? One, verse 2, is it verse 3? I want the verse says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. There, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name. We were singing a song about lifting up our hands. The Bible says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. I'm giving an elementary thought right now just to help our people see where we are, where we came from, and what we want to do. Can you lift up your hands? There was a golfer just this week had to lift his hands up. <laughs> he was arrested, wasn't he? God arrested me. I want to lift up my hands and say, I surrender to you, Lord. I surrender. Have me any way you want to have me. Fill him in my hands. Fill him in my feet. You're in the house of God. You're, you're not at Walmart. Some, some of my French-speaking people say the Walmarts. You're not at the Walmarts. You're at Walmart. You're not at Walmart. You're not at Roses. You're not at Food Lion. You're at the house of God. You can lift up your hands here. Nobody won't even look at you funny. Amen? That first song really touched my heart. It says, I'm coming back to a heart of worship. I want, there's a line in this song that I want y'all to catch. It says, I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it. You ever told the Lord you're sorry? I'd like for you to write that down, I'm sorry. I want to apologize to this local church. I want to apologize to my family. Get my, uh, Paul, get my boxing gloves. I'm going to fight a little bit. I apologize, and my sword too. I apologize for the last few weeks. I was talking to one of the brethren earlier, and I apologize because I feel like I allowed. I'm just going to talk. If y'all don't worry about rushing off to McDonald's, I told y'all can have hot dogs at my house. So it's been a long time since I've been up here talking. So just give me a little space. I want to apologize publicly. I feel like I allowed a spirit to come into the church. Um, I I I feel like I'm a very transparent person, meaning I'm approachable. Let me change it. I'm approachable. May not be as transparent as some may want me to be, but I've never withheld anything when I was asked. I don't want, try to be vague. And a few weeks ago, I wanted to be very transparent because I thought I needed to be and to explain some stuff to the church about my own family. Thank you, son. And I, I believe I allowed a spirit into the church. I think I should have kept some stuff to myself 
and in my house and not brought the church involved in it. And when I thought about this, I wasn't going to talk about this, and I was old sister Celeste is over there saying, oh my goodness. <laughs> but this line of this song said, I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it. I'm not only apologizing to the Lord, but I'm apologizing to this local church. I feel like God's called me to be here. I feel like God commissioned me to be here and to build what he wanted built here. I believe God added to this church every single person that was added to it. I believe God took away every single person that had been taken away from it. Individuals come here, they get healed, they get restored, they get blessed. Then they go on to other things. And uh, I said for many years that I felt like this was a hospital, with a place where people that had issues and problems could come and get healed and go back out and do whatever God's called them to do. And I've always said I need a staff to do that. I need people here to help me build people into what God wants them to be built into. But I crossed some things in my life, and the first thing I want to apologize is for grieving. I've had a broken heart for about two years. A broken heart, and my heart has been broken over a number of things, but one was people. I allowed people to get into my heart, and I got into the heart of the people and wanted to love on them and wanted them to love on me, and a degree of loyalty and, and, and strength was built up in that, and then my heart got broke. And I didn't know how to deal with it. And then one of my pastor friends died suddenly, 54 years old and my heart was broke again. I couldn't imagine how him being over all of those assemblies and churches and, and working and, and helping to do what God wanted him to do was just gone like that. I had to seek and talk to other pastors about it because it just didn't seem like that would be something God would do. I felt like the devil stole that from us. You know, the devil is alive. Y'all better understand that. And he's out to do some things, John 10, 10. For the thief cometh but to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come to do what? To give you life and life more abundantly. Jesus didn't come to give us death. He didn't come to, to steal from us, to kill from us, to destroy from us. He came to give us life. And when I saw that life taken and other lives taken and people left to do what they felt God was calling them to do, it broke my heart. And a broken heart, when you allow a broken heart in your life, you allow things to come in. I want to talk about this, a crisis. Write that down. A crisis. You allow crisis in your life. And if you don't allow the Lord to deal with that crisis, you'll get deeper and deeper into that. You'll find yourself into a grieving that can turn into depression. You can find yourself into a position to where you don't know where to turn, and everything you turn to do seems to be falling apart. Even your home life, even your family, you feel like everything is falling apart. And then I had my best friend's sister, which was like a sister to me, lived two doors down from me on, my, on our road, died what, 54, 56, just gone. And my heart was broken again, I, and I had to do the funeral. <laughs> Here I am with a broken heart, doing a funeral. My heart's getting more broken. And the enemy lied to me. That's what I'm sorry about. I'm sorry that I listened to the enemy. I'm sorry that I allowed the enemy to talk to me. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, the heart of a person is desperately wicked. And who can know it? You can get to a point in your life where you're listening to your heart more than you're listening to God. God told me when I started this ministry, he said to me, there's one thing that I'll do for you. I said, what is that? He said, I'll always give you people. And I, I've held on to that, and I've seen God do that. But yet, and still in all of that, I listened to the enemy. They gone. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, death, they're gone. I'm saying, but Lord, you said you'd always give me people, and, and he did. Well, why are these leaving? <laughs> 
Where are they going? A sister in this local assembly here today gave me a note after one service, said everything that will be shaken will be shaken. But everything that God wants to remain will remain. That gave me strength. I needed more of that. I needed to hear more of God talking to me than the enemy. I needed more of God talking to me than the flesh. Do you know your carnal mind can deceive you? Jeremiah said the heart is wicked. Your heart will deceive you. My heart has deceived me. I'm apologizing for that. I'm apologizing for allowing myself to listen to my heart and not listen to this. Not let this have the preeminence. I'm a word man. And then I started listening to the noise. Everybody around me telling me what they think I should do. What how I should do this, how I should do that. And never did they tell me I prayed about it. And this is what God said. But I, yet I still listen to them. I call it noise because there were so many voices. So many voices I couldn't even hear my own family's voice. I only, I'm trying to listen, I'm trying to navigate, and I couldn't focus. I'm being transparent today if I've never been transparent before in my life. You ever been where you couldn't focus? You couldn't get your thoughts together. It just seemed like there were so many thoughts. You can't sleep. Any, don't raise your hand. You ever wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning? Every morning, every day. Something about waking up at 3 o'clock. Psychiatrists, psychologically, they'll tell you. There's something about your nervous system that makes you wake up at 3 o'clock. <laughs> you need to be asleep. But there's an enemy out here that doesn't want you to be asleep. You can have a nervous system. You can have psychological problems. You can be grieving over something. You can be depressed, anxiety. All those things are real. Being separated from your family, being in a foreign country. You might be a citizen, but you're in a foreign country. And you're trying to navigate. And you don't know how to do things in America because you're from another country. All of these things are battles, and it's causing you to lose sleep. And you're trying to work. You're trying to provide for your family. And I'm apologizing that I allow that to come in here, being the gatekeeper. I needed individuals around me more to rally, to lift up my hands like Aaron and her did, and speak the word in my ear versus in speaking head knowledge. I needed individuals not telling me what their life was like and that what their family was like and their spouses was like and telling you to suck it up and do this. I needed a word person. I needed somebody to feed me, thus saith the Lord, because this is all I know. And and when I began to come out of that pit, when I began to pull myself out of that and find some individuals that started speaking the word into my life, things immediately started changing. I want y'all to know that the word works. For 22 years in this assembly, the word is what has worked this assembly to be what it is. It's the word that has gotten people out of the horrible pit and put them on the solid ground. It's the word that has changed individuals' life. It's the word that got them into the baptismal pool. It's the word that got them through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's the word that got that sickness or that disease off of their body and they walked out of the building healed. It wasn't an ideology. It wasn't man's thoughts. It wasn't a good thing about thinking about this or thinking about that. It wasn't an organization. It wasn't a Baptist or a Methodist or a Church of God or the body of Christ. It wasn't anything like that. It's always been the word. Somebody say the word. See, you need the word of God. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. It's the word. Not only do you need the word, the second thing you need is the Holy Spirit. (laughs) You can't do this in yourself. It's necessary, John chapter number 16. He said, it's necessary that I go away. He said, if I go not away, then the comforter cannot come. God wanting everybody under the sound of my voice to have the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God reigning in your life, accessible. The same way I said Jesus is here, the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit, this is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. You need to pray in the Spirit. I needed somebody to grab my hands and pray in the Spirit. 
See, because when you, Romans chapter number eight, when you pray in the spirit, the Bible says you don't know the words that need to be said, but the spirit itself with groanings that cannot be uttered. See, I'm preaching the word right now. Romans chapter number eight, it says likewise, verse 26, that the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. See, we need the spirit. I can't help your infirmities. I can't change your situation. But when you come in my presence, I need to have a touch of the Holy Ghost in my life. I need to be able to touch heaven so and I can be a, a conduit for heaven to get a prayer through. Yeah. Romans 8, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought. The Lord told me you didn't have anybody that could touch the Holy Ghost. I said, my God, what have I been doing? He said, you got to get somebody around you that can touch the Holy Ghost. I said, is the Holy Ghost real? Yeah, you sang the song, the Holy Ghost is real. No matter what men say. Well, Lord, can somebody pray in the spirit? Can somebody touch the, the Almighty? Can we go past the demonic realm of the principalities and the powers of the air? We got to fight. Everybody say fight. fight. We're in a fight. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. And it ain't a sword like this, but this is the sword that we got to fight with. And I don't need to know what somebody said. I need to know what he said. And you can groan sometimes. Look at this verse of scripture. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the spirit itself will groan. I had some people tell me, Brother Brittany, I've been groaning and praying for you. I've been touching heaven for you. I said, I can feel your prayers. I sent out texts this week. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. I know you were praying. Somebody's got to touch the Holy Ghost. You say, well, what is the language of the Holy Ghost? <laughs> it's angel, angelic language. Find that scripture for me, somebody. I'm all over the place. I know that. But it's been a long time since I've been up here. It's a scripture in the Corinthians, isn't it? It says the Holy Ghost, it said it's, the, it's a, the, the, the sound of angels. It's the voice of the angels. It's, a, it's an angelic language. And that's what, it's after the tongues chapter. I think it's the very next chapter. It's the tongues chapter, the 14th chapter, isn't it? The 1 Corinthians. It says, uh, but neither do we talk with tongues of men, but we talk with tongues of angels. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. See, you need to talk to God. Anybody want to talk to God? What was it, New Edition used to have a song? It says, uh, Mr. Telephone Man. Y'all don't look at me like that. Come on, Sister uh, uh, Alicia, help me. Will you help me? Google it, Mr. Telephone Man. You know it, Jonathan. Something's wrong with my line. When I dial, when I dial my, it, help me. When I dial my baby's number, I get a click every time. <laughs> I don't want to call my baby, Mr. Telephone Man. I don't want to call my baby. I want to talk to God. Yeah. You know when you call God, you don't get a click on the other side. Yeah. When you call God, he answers the phone. He picks up the receiver. Yeah. He begins not only to listen to what you're saying, but he talks back to you. Yeah. Sometimes when he's talking to you, you don't know what he's saying if it's in the spirit. Paul said, I pray in the spirit, but I pray with the understanding also. He said, I, sometimes I need the understanding. What are you saying to me, Lord, in the spirit? I need to hear what you're saying, and I'm, it's too convoluted to get, a, to get an ideology or a, a, a pulse of what you're saying. And he just says, keep on listening. Don't hang up. <laughs> don't hang up on God. Keep the line open. Keep a clear line. Keep a good signal. Sometimes the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. You keep moving too much, you might lose the signal. 
You might get down in the valley. God still wants to get the signal to you down in the valley. You might be up on the mountaintop. God still wants to get a signal to you on the mountaintop. No matter where you are, David said, if I take the wings of the morning, yet you are there. If I go to the lowest parts of the earth, yet you are there. If I go to the highest place, yet you are there. He said, my thoughts are far as your thoughts, as far as the east is from the west. God can be on the east coast. God can be on the west coast. God is in the north. God is in the south. My God is everywhere. You got to talk to him. Don't be afraid to talk to him. Sometimes you can be in such a crisis that you don't even want to talk to him. Second Chronicles chapter number 20, it came to pass, verse 1, that the children of Moab and the children of the Amorite, Ammon, with their other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat the battle. I mean, I want y'all to catch this. The Moabites, the Ammonites, all came. It was the third one, too. What's the next verse? It was the third one, too. The Ammonites, Moabites, they all come after him in the, in the, and it says in verse 2, there came some also, told Jehoshaphat, there comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea in the side of, the, the, of Syria. And behold, they, are, they be in Hazaron, Tamar, which is in Gebe. The living Bible says the king of Moab, Ammon, and the Minyanites, the Minyanites, Ammonites, they're all coming after Jehoshaphat. When God delivered Israel out of the land of Egypt, he told them, leave them, those countries alone. He said, it's all right to leave them alone. Now, I don't want you to overtake everything. Those two countries leave, leave alone. If you know the story of the Moabites, that came from, from uh, who was it, the daughter, Lot, Lot and his daughters. It came about from that. God let those people alone. These individuals forgot that God spared them. And so now they want to take over. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared. See, sometimes an individual, even a leader, can be afraid. Jehoshaphat feared and he set himself to seek the Lord. See, this is the key. When you're going through a tight spot in your life, you need to understand that you can still seek the Lord. It doesn't matter. You, can't, you cannot start seeking out the ideas of man. you got to seek the Lord because your own heart and their heart may deceive you. If it don't line up with thus saith the Lord, it's not for you. It's got to come from the word. This is the law. This is your, your common denominator. This is where you got to come from. So anything outside of this is going to be error. It can be a good idea. It might help for a moment, but it may not get you where you need to be. You need the word. So whatever idea you got, whatever thought you're coming up with, maybe uh, uh, a plan, is your plan God's plan? I was putting together plans that were not God's plan. They were my plan, my idea. Not that God can't bless you in your plan. Not that God can't work through you. Not that God can't use you, but it might not be the right time for God to do that in your life. But the God that we serve is not the God that's going to come down with a hammer and just kill you. He, that he, he has a, a passive wrath. You ought to write that down. The God of the Old Testament was more on-demand kind of stuff, but yet it was even passive. A passive wrath, another word for that, for you scholars that want a biblical term for that, is called grace. He has a passive wrath. He allows you to walk down a walk and do some things, and it's all right. He's not going to say absolutely not, a hard no, but he's saying if you go that way, I'll still be with you, but that's not the perfect way. Thirteen times in the book of Hebrews, Paul said better. You can always find a better way. The way you're going, it may be all okay, but it may not be the best way. Jehoshaphat feared, but he sought the Lord. In his seeking of the Lord, he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Sometimes you need to fast. There's a scripture in the book of Mark, chapter 9, it said, These only come out by prayer. Somebody asked me the other day, How much weight have you lost? <laughs> Some
Sometimes you got to fast. Fasting will allow you to hear the voice of God more clearly. Because sugar and steaks and rolls and coconut cake and cheesecake. I know I'm touching some stuff. Chocolate, greens, cabbage. I'm going to really hit somebody right here. Cornbread. Those things keep you from hearing sometimes. It's hard to hear when you're shoveling. You ever seen somebody when they're going through a, a, a downtime in their life, they don't lose weight, they gain weight because they turn to food. Brother Jonathan shared a verse of scripture with me Thursday. This is the fast that I have chosen. God can choose a fast. And sometimes you need to fast something more than just food. You might need to fast somebody. Oh, okay, all right. He might want you to close your ears to somebody because everything that they're saying is opposite of this. And their ideology, their signs, their thoughts, their wonders, their, their opinions are in opposition of this and is feeding an area in your heart that don't need to be fed. Birds of a feather hang out together. Verse number four, and Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. First of all, Jehoshaphat said, I need help. After that, the people said, we need help. I need some of y'all to say, we need help. First say, Brother Brentley, you need help. Say it. Go ahead. Y'all been wanting to say it for a month. Say it. Brother Brentley, you need help. And then I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to take my help, but will you help me? Do you need help? Are you willing to help do what God wants done? Are you willing to pine out something that maybe not even looked like what we had 20, for the last 20 years? What does the next 20 years look like, sound like, going to be like? Are we, are we keen enough to ask God, can we work in his vineyard right now? It may be different. It may feel different. It may sound different. But can we work in, the, in his kingdom to see people saved, to see people delivered, to see marriages made whole, to see children do right, to see people get off of drugs, to get off of alcohol, to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Do we want to get them in the kingdom? Absolutely. Do we want them to be a part of the first resurrection? Absolutely. But everybody won't be in the first resurrection. Everybody won't make it to that level of, the, of having a celestial body. But we can help people get saved. We want to fill up the kingdom, don't we? I just want to be in that first high calling, but I understand that everybody won't be. Because straight is the gay and narrow is the way, and how many find it? It's the word. Verse number five, and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. I like that, the new court. Everybody say the new court. He got in front of the temple. He didn't do this anywhere else. He did this at the house of God. Do you know how important it is to assemble together? It's important to come to church. Why? Because it's the church building? No. Because it's a, it, it costs money to run it? No. The reason why assembling ourselves together is so important is because of the person beside you. They need you as much as you need them. Nowhere in this Bible did God tell us to be solitary. It's the opposite. He said, I call the solitary and I put them in families. I, I take somebody from being alone and I connect them in the family. We could change terminology. Everybody say the family of God. That's a biblical term. I want to be in his family. And his family gathers together. And when they gather together, you want to be caught there in the midst of them. 
David said that one time of, oh, no, it was it, who was it that said that about uh, Jonathan, wasn't it? Or David, or help me with a story. The dad looked around the table and he said, somebody's missing. Who was that? that Saul said, somebody's missing. And sometimes you got to look around the table and say, where is so-and-so? Why are they missing? We need them. What happened? Are they okay? There's nothing wrong with checking up on our brothers and sisters. You never know who needs what, when. And sometimes somebody is crying out for help without opening their mouth. I'm going to work on that for a minute. Just, cause they did, just because they didn't raise their hand and say, I have a prayer request, doesn't mean they don't have one. Just because they're not voicing their concerns or their hurts don't mean they don't have concerns and hurts. Are we spiritually enough to be able to discern that my brother is hurting? My sister has a concern. I need to reach out to them. I got to go seek them and find them. It said, Cain said, uh, God said to Cain, Cain, where is your brother? He said, man, I, uh, mm -mm. I ain't my brother's keeper. God looked at him and said, yes, you are. And you need to go find your brother. He's your brother. Brother Jonathan today opened the service and said, we need to get away from being so good at what Martha does and be more about what Mary's doing for Jesus. We need to be doing more Jesus' work than we are Martha's work. You know how easy it is to do Martha's work? It's so easy. I think I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to say it, I'm a perfect Martha. <laughs> I can do some stuff just so transactional, just right to the T, just so, I mean, just perfect. But it's all Martha stuff. It's just nice. It's in order. It looks good, sounds good, smells good, tastes good. It's just perfect. But that might not be what God's doing. God might smash that. Oh, that just, that, just for me to say that, that God could smash something, like makes my skin crawl, and that ain't the Holy Ghost. I like seeing things put together. <laughs> Sister Brentley, you asked me, how could I tie this in? I'm going to have to tie it in. Anybody know the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty? Who know it? You know it? What's the rest of it? Who it is? How, when, did, when did you learn that? How Kindergarten. And you can still quote that? Anybody got a scripture in you like that? You can run Humpty Dumpty down like that? Can you run a scripture down like that? The same brain that learned Humpty Dumpty is the same brain that can learn, thus saith the Lord. You might have to go back to kindergarten, but... <laughs> Humpty Dumpty, we don't know how he fell. Did somebody push him? Did a wind come by? The, 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 the sad part of the story that all the king horses and all the king's men, everybody tried to put him back, but nobody could put him back together again. We got a problem in America where we try to fix stuff. We try to think the government could fix it. We think that our neighbors could fix it. No, we got a, a more, uh, a, 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 it's, a, it's, a be, it's a different war going on than a political war. We have a spiritual war that's going on. You know who can put Humpty Dumpty back together again? The Lord can. He's the healer. He's Jehovah Rapha. He can take something that's been shattered and put it back together again. The scripture says, what if somebody dies in the sea? He said the Lord can get them if they drown, and even if a, if a shark comes and eat them. He said he can still put that person back together again. He said, what if somebody was burned in a fire and all there is is ashes? God said, that ain't nothing to me. He said, I can take ashes and turn them into beauty. He said, I can take, he said, I, in the revelations, he said, I'm going to call them from the sea. Those that died in the sea, I'm going to bring them back. Those that died in the fire, I'm going to bring them back. He said, no, I ain't worried about that. See, God can put things back together again. 
Mr. Dumpty couldn't get put back together by the king, by the king's horsemen. None of those things. Verse 6, and they said, O Lord God, our fathers, art not thou the God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of, of the heathen? You, ro you rule over the kingdoms and you rule over the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Listen to Jehoshaphat pray. Verse 7, art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land? Before thy people Israel, and gave it us the seed of Abraham, Abraham thy friend forever. This is Jehoshaphat praying. And they dwelt therein, and they built thee a sanctuary therein in their name, saying, If, when evil cometh upon us, verse 9, as the sword of judgment and pestilence and famine, we stand before this house. We're not anywhere but before your house. We stand before you in this house and we cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou will hear and help. Somebody today needs to cry out to God in your affliction and you can hear that God will hear you and he will help you. Somebody should have said amen right there. Verse 10 says, and now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and, and, and Mount Seir whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they have turned from them and destroyed them not. He said they didn't hurt them back then, but now they're coming after us. Verse 11, behold, I say how they reward us to come and cast us out of thy position. He said they forget everything that we did for them. And because they, for, they forgot that we spared them, now they're here to attack us. He goes on to say, will thou hast given us to inherit? We could have took them. Or we could have said, forget y'all. We're going to kill y'all with everybody else. We're not going to help you. We're not going to spare you. But they did. But now they don't want to spare Israel. Verse 12. Look at this, verse 12. Oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. The Lord showed me this, this verse of scripture. I got to a place there was nothing that I could do. Another thing that I like to do is fix stuff. Do you know sometimes you can't fix somebody? <laughs> Only Brother Luigi got that. You must have tried to fix somebody. Some people can't, some people you can't fix. It takes God to fix them. Some people you can't fix. It takes themselves to fix them. Until you realize who you are. If this was a mirror, the number one deception we have is ourself. And sometimes we look in a mirror and we feel like, oh, that looks good. That sounds good. That's right. The Bible says it like this. Every man is right in his own eyes. That just means when you look at yourself, automatically you say, he's right. She's right. Everybody else is wrong. So when you feel like you're right, guess what? You don't need to be fixed. You don't think you're broke. You think you're all right. And sometimes you got to get to a point where you're so low that you finally realize, I'm broke. Humpty Dumpty again. <laughs> Shattered. Broken into pieces. Needing to be fixed. He even went to somebody and said, can you fix me? Sometimes we got to realize we need to go to somebody, God, and say, Lord, I need you to fix me. This verse says, we have no might against this great company. We can't do it. Neither, please underline this, neither know we what to do. How could Jehoshaphat, the leader, not know what to do? Earlier when I started talking, I was apologizing for things that I'd done. Hindsight's always 20-20. If I could go back, I would have did them different but I was at a position in my life where I did not know what 
to do. But, let's read this last part together. Our eyes are upon thee. Bensonita Hosa used to tell us from Nigeria, he said, when you don't know what to do, do what you know. When I didn't know what to do, all I could do is still keep coming to church. <laughs> when I didn't know what to do, all I could do was keep reading my Bible. When I didn't know what to do, all I could do was keep praying. When I didn't know what to do, all I could do was keep fasting. When I didn't know what to do, all I could do was keep singing, keep worshiping him, because I didn't know what to do. But I kept my eyes upon him. A lot of people, when they go through things like I've been through, they lose their sight of God. And they turn to the world or to a bottle or to some drugs or something like that. No, I kept my eyes on him. And because I kept my eyes on him, he did something. He put everything back together again. Drop down to verse 15. And he said, hearken ye all Judah. And you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thy king Jehoshaphat. So this is one of the priests, Je Je Jehazel, verse 14. Jehazel gets up and begins to get a word from God. Sometimes you need a Jehazel. You need somebody to hear from God. Then upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord moved in the midst of the congregation and got on a Jehazel. Jehazel is not even the key person in this story. It's Jehoshaphat. You might be a Jehaziel. God's calling you to be in the congregation, and when the Spirit of the Lord moves, he needs you to prophesy. He needs you to hear what thus saith the Lord is because Jehoshaphat can't hear God. He's in a position where he says, I don't know what to do. But a Jehaziel hears from God, stands up in the midst of the congregation, and begins to prophesy. Go to verse 15. And when he prophesied, he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat. Whoa! He said, no, not just uh, Judah, but Jehoshaphat too. The, the prophet began to address the leader. And he's, the leader has to be in a spirit and a mindset that he can receive from Jehaziel. Oh, y'all didn't catch that. See, sometimes the leader can get so high that he can't sit down. And if he can't sit down, he want to keep on doing everything. And because he's still doing everything, he can't hear from Jehaziel. But God sent some Jehaziels by here to speak to the leader. That's all right. If ain't nobody going to shout, but I am. Sometimes God will bring somebody in your life that's hearing from God when you can't hear from him. Some of y'all have been my Jehaziel in the valley in the shadow of death. You ought to thank God right there. It says, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid. <laughs> Sometimes the Bible says 365 times, Fear not in the Bible. And yet the enemy will tell you, you ain't being heard. The enemy will tell you, you're not worth anything. You're Jehaziel, but you're not anything. Nobody wants to hear what you got to say. That's the devil. That's the lying spirit. He's been a liar from the beginning. You do have something to say. You do have something to contribute. The enemy is always wanting to divide and conquer and run people off and scare people because they feel like they don't have value. Don't put your value in what man says to you. Put your value in what God says about you. You're God's anointed. You didn't come up with your anointing on your own. I had to look myself in the mirror and say, Paul Brittley, you didn't do this. Over the last month, God did this. He added to the church daily such that should be saved. He showed me I don't need you. You just need me. And then when I understand, I need God more than God needs me. <laughs> I need God 
more than God needs me. And not only do I need God, I need Jehaziel. This morning, praying <laughs> while getting hot dogs. Oh my goodness, they cooking right now. Looking at hot dogs and counting them. It was like a phone call. God said, I'll give you a Jehaziel. And I said, okay. But um, what if they're, they're all gone? <laughs> How you going to give me something that ain't there? I'm talking back to him. And it was plain as day, don't look for Jehaziel to look like what you think Jehaziel should look like. Don't you think that because of a past relationship, that automatically makes him Jehaziel? He said, I might, or not might, I will bring you a Jehaziel from among your inhabitants. From where you are is your Jehaziel's. I'm thinking, but I want that one to be Jehaziel. I want this one to be Jehaziel because they can do this with me and they know that about me and they work well with me and they do this. And the Lord's saying, no, Jehaziel didn't have no kind of reputation. But Jehoshaphat was wise enough in God that he recognized when the hand of God was on Jehaziel. Listen to what Jehaziel said. Thou king... Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude. He said, for the battle is not yours. <laughs> he said, the battle is not yours. Whose battle is it? The battle is not yours. See, so often we think that this is our battle. I was asked, how can you determine the difference between a battle and a war? How can you tell the difference between a battle and a war? We war not against flesh and blood but against principalities and power. We're all in a battle. God's going to win this battle. This is not our battle. Why are you fighting then? <laughs> Why are you trying to win? Why are you trying to figure it out? All of us fight different. Some of you are fighting in different kind of cases. Jehoshaphat found himself in a crisis situation. In his case, it was from his enemies. It was from without. But some of y'all are fighting battles from within. It's different from without. Jehoshaphat was from without. It's easier to deal with without battles than it is within battles. Because the within battle will deceive you because all of us think our heart is right. Every man's right in his own eyes. As hard as it is for both of us, we not always right. Shake my hand. You, you come. <laughs> is that hard? But we're not always right. God's always right. So it was a crisis of war, a threat from a powerful enemy. So some of you have health crises. Some of you have financial crisis. Some of you have family crisis. Anybody got an employment crisis? 
a job, pro a job problem, can't find work, anybody need a raise, anybody's health deteriorating, financial, just not enough. It's a crisis. You pull into the, to the yard or to the house and there's a cutoff notice on the door. Is that a crisis? You go snatch it because you don't want nobody to see it. The enemy from without can attack us, but the enemy from within can attack us too. A lot of times we feel like we need Jesus to help us to fight the battle and the Lord is saying, I need you. There was a little five-year-old boy. His mama told him, Johnny, go get that can of tomatoes out of the pantry. And Johnny said, okay. I'm sorry, I don't know Johnny. I'm going to use another name, okay? <laughs> Johnny's okay. <laughs> it wasn't that Johnny. And Johnny says his mama, I don't want to go get that can of tomatoes. It's dark in there. And she says, Johnny, if you don't go get that can of tomatoes, go get it. It's dark in there. She says, Johnny, Jesus will go with you. Matter of fact, Jesus is already in the closet. You just go on in there and get that can of tomatoes. Johnny, all of a sudden, Brother Larry, he says, okay. And he goes to the closet he opens the door. He looks in there. He says, it's dark in there. And Johnny says, Jesus, if you were in there, hand me that can of tomatoes. <laughs> so often, we want Jesus to do it, don't we? And Jesus is saying, no, I need you to go in there and face your fears. Face them head on. It's normal for a Christian to get paralyzed by fear. Jehoshaphat was paralyzed. We have enemies that paralyze us. Satan is against us. And it's, it's not a pretty picture, but what I would like to close here is with this. What we need to do is carefully look at how Jehoshaphat dealt with this situation. How do most people generally handle a crisis? This is what they do. They cover it up. Some of they just cover it up, act like it never happened. That's how most people deal with crisis. Some people just give up. They just quit. The enemy ever told you, Sister Gail, just quit. What's the point, Sister Sandra? What's the point? Why even do it anymore? Why even try? And that's the enemy. That's a, that's a lie from the devil. Why even try? We get paralyzed. Some deny they even have a problem. So I said some give up, some cover up, and some just deny that they have a problem. And then some panic. And when, they pa when you panic, you automatically start doing things in the carnal, in the flesh, because you become reactive. God doesn't want you to be reactive. He wants you to be proactive. And then some, the last one, number five, some fall apart completely. The Lord has helped me to avoid those. Prayerfully, each one of those. I didn't cover it up. I didn't give up. I didn't deny I had a problem. I didn't panic. And I didn't fall apart completely. You know why? Because I realized the battle was not mine. It's the Lord's. Jehoshaphat's response to the crisis was not alarm and panic. He asked the Lord what to do. Psalms 105 verse 4 says, look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Psalms 121 verse 1 says, I lifted up my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, 
the maker of heaven and earth. God answered Jehoshaphat through Jehaziel. And I believe some of you are my Jehaziel. Not only are you my Jehaziel, but you are a Jehaziel for other people. I didn't even know this Bible character existed. I mean, I haven't read the Bible, I don't know how many times. But I was looking for something about battles. And a very familiar scripture, verse chapter 20, verse 15 from 2 Chronicles, says, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord. And I never knew who said that. God's calling some of you this morning, or this afternoon now, because this long-winded preacher, a Jehaziel. Are you willing to take on the mantle of Jehaziel and help build what God wants built? Or are you going to run from your mantle? All heads bowed, all eyes closed. Father, I pray over this congregation this afternoon that you have put a spirit in the, among the people of Judah here in Dallas. You put a spirit. Your Holy Spirit is rolling through this place. And as your spirit is rolling through this place, you're touching Jehaziel's individuals that hear you and you're commissioning them to speak to me and speak to other people in this church as your voice. God, I just pray where the enemy is trying to deceive them that they don't have a voice, trying to make them quench that spirit. I bind that in the name of Jesus Christ. I take authority over every deceiving spirit that has driven a Jehaziel away from this church. That has caused them to leave because of my own error, because of me getting in my own broken heart. God, I pray a blessing over them wherever they are. Let them be a voice wherever they are. But God, I pray right now that you let them come back and be a voice to me a voice to this assembly in Jesus' name. Then I pray not for the only for those that have left that were Jehaziel's, but I pray for those that are on the fence, that are wondering if too they should go be a voice somewhere else. If that's the mandate and the word that you've put into their heart, God, I don't stand in the way of that. Use them for your glory. But if they're being deceived by a voice outside of your voice, I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. I take authority over it in the name of Jesus. And I believe right now you hear clearly from God, not from your own heart, not from your flesh, and not from the devil. But you hear from Almighty God that's called you to be what he's called you to be. If you're here in this building today and you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't even know what we're talking about, but you feel something. You feel a knocking on your heart calling you to come to Jesus. If you just lift your hand up right now, I want to pray for you if you're here today. Amen. I see that hand. If you're here today and you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you heard me talk about having a connection with God, and you, you want that connection today. You feel like, I need the Spirit of God in me. I need to be baptized in water. I need to be baptized in the Spirit. If you're here today and you need the Holy Spirit baptism, raise your hand. If you're here today and you need healing in your body, you feel like you're suffering in a way when you feel like God could touch you, Raise your hand. Heavenly Father, you've seen these hands that have been raised. Anointing of the Holy Ghost. Right now, bring healing. You said you sent your word and you healed them. Let your spirit move among this place right now. Go between every chair, every aisle. Touch these individuals. Lay your healing hand on them right now. Allow virtue to come out of you. 
and to go into them and to change their situation. We curse every spirit of sickness. We curse every disease. We curse every anxiety, every depression, every stress. We curse you right now. And we cause health and joy and beauty and love and peace in the name of Jesus to come in and to reside. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you believe those prayers, would you say amen? Amen. amen. We're going to close here and. In-